All right, so my name is Dale Fonkin. I'm a native aquatics biologist with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources in Springville. Uh, most of my job uh, entails studying population trends of the June sucker here in Utah Lake. Uh, the June sucker is an endangered species, although currently we're proposing that it be downlisted to threatened, and that's because the population has been recovering pretty significantly in the recent years. Um, the suckers became endangered for a variety of reasons. Uh, two, two of the reasons I'm going to talk about today, uh, first invasive species, and then some habitat destruction and um, uh, degradation that uh, has occurred. So one of the primary reasons the sucker was endangered is due to the introduction of common carp. Common carp were introduced in the 1800s to Utah Lake, and they've been a driving force of a lot of negative interactions with native fish like the June sucker, as well as some of the, the vegetation and water quality in Utah Lake. Carp are omnivores. They eat both plants and animals. Uh, and here in Utah Lake, they eat a lot of uh, the shoreline vegetation. So they're, they're kind of rooting around along the shore, uh, digging up those plants, eating the plants. Uh, and that's a big problem because uh, the June sucker, the life history is such that um, they spend the most, most of their life cycle in the lake, but every May and June, they swim up the tributaries, uh, such as the Provo River, Spanish Fork, Hobble Creek, and they spawn in those tributaries. Uh, so when they do that, their young larvae, uh, they drift down the rivers back into the lake. And historically, uh, those young dune sucker utilized that vegetation as refuge from predators. So without that refuge, those young dune sucker larvae are just kind of sitting ducks for some of the other fish here in the lake, and they get they get eaten up, and that's one of the main reasons why um, the suckers became endangered. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing for about 10 years now to try and recover the June sucker is remove some of these invasive carp. So there's a local crew here in Provo uh, that commercially fish for carp. They've been doing it for 10 years. Uh, they've removed about 29 million pounds of carp since that program began. Uh, that's resulted in about an 80% reduction in the total carp biomass here in Utah Lake. So uh, that was kind of the goal from the outset of that program, is to reduce the, the carp biomass by about 80%. We figured that that would result in some of those shoreline plants coming back, allowing more refuge for the June sucker. And we've started to see that. We've started to see in the last couple of years some of those plants coming back. We've started to see some suckers that um, are of wild origin, which is, which is good. We like to see that. Um, and it has it resulted in additional benefits, such as uh, water quality as well. Uh, when these carp root up these plants, it, it results in turbidity, uh, mur murky water. I would assume some of uh, your fourth grade class has been down to Utah Lake and seen uh, the water here. Uh, it's actually improving, um, we think, due to carp. Um, so with continued rem removal, we anticipate uh, more positive benefits from that. Um, another invasive species that is here in Utah Lake that's problematic is the northern pike. And they are a large, uh, very toothy, aggressive predator. So they were introduced about 10 years ago, so it's a, a more recent problem. Uh, but as their population grows, uh, we anticipate that they'll be a uh, significant issue for June sucker just because their diet consists entirely of fish. So they're eating a lot of June sucker and, uh, and additional fish here in Utah Lake as well. Uh, we've seen June sucker, we've seen white bass, we've seen walleye uh, in their stomachs. So that's another growing issue. Um, but yeah, we've, uh, we're out here today collecting some June sucker. We just collected about eight um, and put our tracking tags in them. Uh, that's typically what our work consists of here in the spring. These fish are congregating here at the state park uh, along these jetties. They're getting ready to swim up the Provo River and spawn. So they'll just, they just kind of hang out here, um, wait for, they're usually drawn in by an increasing flow in the Provo River. They can sense more water coming down. Um, that draws them into the river and in another month or so we should see a few thousand fish in the Provo River spawning. This morning uh, we launched our boat here at Utah Lake State Park. We went out and set these uh, nets. They're called trammel nets. Uh, they're designed uh, to catch fish. As the fish swim into these nets, 
they get tangled up, uh, we can then retrieve the nets, pull the fish out, put them in this tub of water here so they, so they stay alive and happy for a while while we're doing our um, exercise here, putting pit tags in them. Um, these nets are about 150 feet long. Uh, they are about six feet, six feet deep. So they'll kind of sit in the water um, perpendicular to the, uh, the ground um, and, and fish will swim into them, get tangled up. So this is a white bass. It's one of our most popular sport fish here in Utah Lake. We just caught uh, probably about a couple dozen of these in our nets right off here at the state park. Um, this is probably a little bit bigger than they, they normally get, although this year we're seeing some bigger white bass than previous years. They're getting ready to spawn, so pretty soon they'll be charging up the Provo River. It's a great time to fish for them. They're, they're a good fighting fish for how small they are, and they also taste really good, so if anyone out there likes fishing, this is a good time to get out to Utah Lake State Park and catch some of these white bass. So these are uh, kind of a, a close cousin of the striped bass in Lake Powell, just a lot smaller. Um, there's actually a species called the wiper bass. It's half white bass, half striper. Um, those are in some other lakes. <clears throat> but this is a, <clears throat> a fish that's a little bit dangerous because it's got spikes everywhere. It's got spikes on the dorsal fin, spikes on the pectoral fin, um, spikes on the opercle. So it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's not a fun fish to handle all the time, but um, certainly fun to catch. All right, so here we have a June sucker. It's an endangered species in Utah Lake. We're getting ready to um, work it up, weigh it, measure it, and put some of our tracking tags in it. Um, right now I'll get a length in millimeters. It's 421 and get a weight in kilograms, 1.08. So now that we have that, um, I guess one other thing we do is we denote whether it's a male or a female. So <clears throat> this one's a male. We know that because it has these white bumps on its uh, fin here. Um, males get those to fight off other males when they're spawning. So um, this is, looks like they're developing. They only get these in the spawning season. So th it's only at this time of year that we can tell um, what gender they are. So now we'll do a coded wire tag scan um, this tells us whether this fish is from a hatchery uh, that we raised and stocked it or if it's possibly from Utah Lake itself and a wild fish. So this fish did not have a coated wire tag, <clears throat> meaning that it could be potentially wild. Now we're going to scan for a pit tag or a passive integrated transponder tag. Um, this tells us, this is, that allows us to actually track where the fish is going in the lake. Um, so the life history of this fish is such it uh, spends most of, it, most of its time in the lake, um, but every May or June it will swim up one of the tributaries, either the, either the Provo River, Hobble Creek, Spanish Fork, American Fork, <clears throat> and it'll spawn. So these fish are getting ready to spawn right now, and um, this fish did not have a tracking tag, so we're going to put that in right now. So this tag is... Um, about 12 millimeters long. It's actually the same technology that people use to put a chip in their dogs and their cats. <clears throat> so it has a unique number that uh, we can actually track. So Sean here is gonna scan that number and record it. I just put one of those tracking tags in um, this sucker and that's, that's gonna allow us to, uh, if we catch this fish again, to know where we caught it, uh, where it came from, how much it's grown, uh, what tributaries it's used to spawn, um, all sorts of uh, information that, that we can use. <clears throat> um, since this fish did not have a coated wire tag, it means it, it's potentially a wild fish, which we're really interested in knowing that because <clears throat> if we want to make sure these fish uh, fully recover and get removed from the Endangered Species Act, we need to have these wild fish um, making up a, a good proportion of the population. So what I'm doing right now is taking a fin clip of this fish. And the reason I'm doing that is because we can actually tell where this fish is from by looking at uh, the chemicals in these fin rays. So this looks a little bit brutal, but 
it's actually just fine. This, this piece of the fin will grow back and this fish will be just fine. All right, so I don't know if you guys can see that, but this is a little piece of fin that we'll send off to the lab and they'll tell us whether that fish was uh, from a hatchery um, or they'll, they'll tell us that it's from here in Utah Lake. And we want, we want to find out that this fish is in Utah Lake. That means the other fish are successfully producing wild fish and helping the population. Um, we, can't, we can't stock these fish forever. Um, it's kind of an intermediate step right now to save the population from extinction. So the more of those fish we see, the, the better off the population is. So we do, like, we do like catching those fish that don't have a hatchery tag.